We are in the book of Ephesians. And as we attend to the book of Ephesians, what we have to do is look at and understand something that's going on. So here's what I want to do. I want you and I to take a minute and understand that we are stepping into a little bit of a three-part series within the series of Ephesians. This next three weeks really goes well together. The problem is, and if you're visiting with us, you're going to be like, wow, that was kind of a downer. Today is, we, we talk about being children of wrath. And we'll move on to, um, to understanding how we're saved by grace through faith. And we're created for God's purposes. Over these next three weeks, we're going to unpack that. It's not always the easiest topic to talk about sin, to talk about the reality of it and the effects of it. But we're going to do that today. And we don't apologize for that because if it weren't for our sin, then the cross of Christ wasn't necessary. But it was necessary. Christ did have to die. And it's not because you and I are good people. It's because fundamentally there's something wrong. So I want to do something today. I don't normally write in public because I'm dyslexic and I spell poorly, but um, I want to do something. I'm going to put this up here. It says God, right? So in the beginning was God, and God is holy, and God is good, and God is just. He's all these things, and he created us, humanity, in his image. Okay, but something happened. There was a fatal flaw. There was that sin in the garden, and that sin put a barrier between us and God. So I want you to do me a favor. Since we understand that this barrier has prevented us from getting to God, this barrier of sin, I want you to help me out a little bit. You're going to have to shout out in church. And if you're a Reformed person, you're like, we don't shout in church. That's a Pentecostal thing. Knock it off. Shout in church. All right. Um, So here's the thing. Who's the worst? Like, think of sinners. Like, think of them. You're like, okay, I can't say them because they're with me here. But um, but, but I have to. (laughs) Joking. Uh, It's uh, it's not funny. I shouldn't joke about sin. Um, So you think of sin, and you think of the worst sinner. Who's the worst sinner in the history of the world? Who can you think of? Hitler. 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 Y'all, you guys got to remember Stalin, too. Stalin was a doorknob as well. But we're going to give old A.H. a chance here. He's down on the bottom, right? Adolf Hitler, yes, pretty sinful, okay? Not a good person, Adolf. So who is a good person that you know? Somebody like, somebody who's been good at life, you know? Whoa, again? Oh, wow, let's just take her to the top of the list. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Who's pretty good? Mother Teresa. What's really good then? All right. Oh, we're about to spell Teresa wrong. All right. So um, between Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler, the rest of us exist, right? The rest of us are somewhere in between here. So let's just do this. We'll put Grandma here because GMA, not Good Morning America, but Grandma. Um, So we'll put Grandma here. Somewhere here below Grandma, I get a B, Pastor Eric, right? And then um, for most of us, we live kind of in this section. Hopefully Hitler's not with us today. But if you are, there's a chance for salvation, right? But, um, but for us, we understand Grandma, Pastor Eric, Mother Teresa. But here's the problem, and here's the fatal flaw. If you're the best person, you're the Billy Graham or the Mother Teresa, what do we do about this? What do we do about the gap? between the best person ever and God, because it still exists. We have to understand that no matter how good a person is, have you ever heard that? Why do I need Jesus? I mean, I'm a good person, so is she, and there's still a gap. There's still a gap that separates humanity from this perfect, loving, holy God. We're going to talk in Ephesians today about that. And we're going to take a look at it and understand that when we say, I'm not that bad, we in our lives are trying to put some Novocaine on our soul and help us feel like there's a way to bridge this. I'm a good person, right? But what if we're not? What if we have to face the fact that sin has attached itself to you and I in the same way it did to Adam and Eve? to Adolf Hitler, to Mother Teresa. What if we are all under the same curse? Let's take the what if out of it. We are all under the same curse. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says it this way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions, which means, or sins, 
uh, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All, um, all of us also lived among them at one time. All of us were sinners. And we did that by gratifying or satisfying the cravings of our bodies. And we followed its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest of them, we were by nature deserving of wrath. If you're a visitor today, you're like, this feels good. I like this. Thank you. I'm deserving of wrath. Not like, you know, punishment, but wrath. Dropping a heavy W on it, right? You're deserving of wrath. The wrath of Almighty God coming down the line in humanity for our disobedience, for the things we've done that separated us from God. Um, Eugene Peterson is an incredible theologian, and he wrote the transliteration of the Bible called The Message. Now, it's not an exact translation because what Eugene Peterson did is he wove it into um, more contextually appropriate language for us. Uh, He made the message read more like an English conversation. And um, he's a great theologian. He's an incredible Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic scholar. So he knew what he was doing. But in this today, I want to take a minute and read that same block of Scripture in a way that maybe we'll understand. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired, stuck in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. Oh, this is a good one, isn't it? Good job, Eugene. And then exhaled disobedience. Oh, go back if you could real quick. We all did it. We were all part of it. Jump on if you could. All of us, doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. When you read it like that, you begin to understand that for you and I, there is a fundamental issue at stake to understand. Good people don't go to heaven. Hear that for me. Good people don't go to heaven. Christians go to heaven. Right? Because good people suffer from the same flaw that you and I do. A heredity of sin that allows us to fill our lungs with unbelief and exhale disobedience. Think about that. Fill your lungs with with unbelief and exhale disobedience. There's a really interesting connection, and I think I'm guessing why Eugene wrote it this way, is because in the Hebrew language, when you talk about the name of God, Yahweh, right? And they pronounce it a little differently in the Hebrew. When you talk about Yahweh, it actually phonetically is the sound of breathing. The sound of breathing. You fill your lungs and you let it out. God, the breath in our lungs, every time you take a breath, you confess the name of God. And and what Eugene does in this is he says, every time you filled your lungs or took a breath, you drank in unbelief and you exhaled disobedience. You were a heretic, you were um, chained to this sinful nature by your heredity, by your birthright. It was yours, and you couldn't get away from it. This is not just for us, it's the people of, of Ephesus. The people in the book of Ephesians who Paul wrote this to were doing this exact thing. What they were doing was a ton of sexual immorality. There was no restrictions on horrible behavior. From slavery to every form of human bondage and brokenness you could imagine was taking place in Ephesus. Just like our American context. Just like in America nowadays. You think, well, it's not going on here. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Or trafficking wouldn't be an issue in our day and age. But human beings are trafficked for their bodies or whatever they can do. There is still slavery rampant for tens of millions of people across this globe. In an age of technology and connection, we remain bound to the same heredity as the people of Ephesus. We are pleasing everything. We can get our hands on, take it, and enjoy it in the moment, even though it's leading to death in our own life. And it's no different then than it is today. So what we have to do is we have to understand a little bit of something of why God gave us the Hebrew sacrificial system. Why did God 
turn around and give to us the understanding that sin equals death. Why did he do that? This is really important for us to understand and important for the church to get a grip on. So we quit being good people and we start being Christians. People who know that we were going to hell without Christ. Sin equals death. In Genesis chapter 3, there's a conversation between the very first woman, Eve, and the serpent. And she took and ate of the fruit which God had said do not eat. She gave it to her husband, Adam. And what did they do immediately after that? They realized that they were naked. So they went and they sewed fig leaves together. And they made themselves little vegan dresses, right? They put this on. And God came and found them. But there's something that happens because the serpent said to the woman, what will happen if you eat of this tree? And she said, we shall surely die. And he goes, you won't die. You won't die. You'll become like God. And immediately upon eating it, their eyes were opened. And they saw sin, but they didn't see it out there. They saw it in here. And they weren't like God. They were under God's wrath now, and this new barrier had been put across, no longer able to fellowship, but something happened even out of that. What's the first thing God did after the fall? After he talked to Adam and Eve, he went and made garments for them out of the skins of animals, which means what? That day, death entered the picture. Something died to cover them. It's interesting, isn't it? Something died to cover their nakedness, their shame. But we need to understand the closer context. Adam was given rule over the Garden of Eden, and he was told to name the creatures. He was close with them. It was like God taking your dog and making a coat out of it. Imagine the pain and the horror when Adam and Eve saw a familiar skin on their back and the carcass of something they loved laying on the ground. Death entered the picture when sin took over. And what God did is he let them know from day one, sin equals death. And how do we know this? How did it carry on? Because the Hebrew people were given the law of God. And the law of God would not allow them to be separate from death. If you look in the book of Leviticus, which most Christians don't read because it's wild. I mean, it's amazing what you read in there. But what we understand is there was a sacrificial system that reminded us time after time that sin equals death. And God kept death before his people constantly. It was constantly. And it was not to make God happy. God didn't have them slaughtering sheep and doves and ox, and bull, and all these different creatures. He didn't have them doing it because God needed more meat. God had, him, had them doing this so that the cost of sin was ever in front of them. That sin equals death. And in Leviticus chapter 4, they, they really unpack two kinds of sin. Willful sin, there was a bunch of sacrifices for. But there were twice as many sacrifices detailed out for sin committed kind of by accident, right? A time when you stub your toe and you call a vacuum something it was never intended to be, it'd probably be a little more willful. But then those moments where you just make an honest mistake, and it was a mistake, but it's still a sin. And God had twice as many ordinances for people's in, like, mistaken sin, things they didn't mean to do but they did anyway. God had twice as many of those. God set up a system of sacrifice that would remind people continually that death accompanies sin. And in death, we rest apart from God. How terrifying is that? How unhappy of a message is that? When we recognize that the sacrificial system was to keep death before the people of God to understand that sin's consequences are laying over on the altar. And the smell of blood and, and meat in the hot Mediterranean sun filled the temple constantly. Why? 
Because if sin meant death, God wanted us to understand the cost of living unfaithfully. He wanted us to see and experience what it was to lose something we loved in order that we know what we truly lost. We lost our connection to God. We lost our relationship with God in sin. So for you and I, we recognize that even in the Passover, what God did is he told them, find a lamb without blemish and raise it close to your home like a pet. Keep it close. Let it be dear to you, close to you. And then on Passover, they would kill the lamb. Why? Because they had to be reminded of the intimate consequence of death because of sin. God wouldn't let them off the hook. He wanted them to see, if you sin, this is what comes. And somehow we've muted that message to think, I can get away with it. I can keep a hidden sin from God. We can't. I can keep a hidden sin from this community. You probably can. But from God, you cannot. We inherently breathe in unbelief and exhale disobedience. Our breathing has no longer become a confession of God. It has become a willful, prideful separation from God by our own declaration. So what we have to do is look at this and understand it's not a new issue. It's been going on since the fall of humanity, since that line first came into being where we are separated from God. Even in Romans 8, Paul writes this, that creation is groaning under the weight and burden of sin. It's groaning. It's like it's pressing it down. Creation itself is tired of the weight and burden of sin of the death and destruction that has followed our choices. So we understand that sin is just not just an Old Testament topic. It's really alive, and it's wrecking the world today. It's wrecking lives and people today. There is death, there is disease and disaster, and they are all a part of the brokenness of sin. Sin has ushered in death in its many horrid, lurid ways. And it's many faces that haunt our lives. Sin has come in and brought death with it. And we need to understand that we, like creation, groan under the weight of sin. And if the church never groans under the weight of its sin, it will never be able to experience the hope of repentance. We have to understand who we are. So we're going to apply this. And we're going to look at broken places and places we break. Because for you and for me, we could justify why well, I didn't mean to. But that doesn't mean God doesn't take your sin seriously. I, do, I didn't mean to doesn't count. I have three children. I think that's their middle name. Joshua, I didn't mean to, Folkers. She'd be like, Josh, why'd you do that? I don't know, I didn't mean to. You're not, it doesn't mean you didn't, right? It doesn't mean you didn't play baseball with a glass. And that was dumb. Still broken glass, well, I didn't mean to. Well, still shards everywhere, right? Why, why did you do that? I don't know, I wanted to juggle. I didn't mean to. It doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean its effects aren't there. There's this in my life. There's these places that are broken, and there's places that I break. Sin has broken us in ways that we will never fully understand. But if you've ever been affected by disease, by loss, by shame, by any of these things, you've experienced broken places. You have those in your life. And I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying the world rests and groans under a burden of sin. And sin is present in our reality. There are broken places, but there's also the places that we break. And this week, I have a very clear ask of you. What's groaning around you? And I want you to think about that. I want you to leave this place and go take a look at the world and ask yourself again and again and again and again, what is groaning? Where do I see the agony and the oppression of the world around me? Maybe the groaning comes out in the middle of, you know, drive time traffic. 
and you see somebody just losing their mind behind the wheel and you can hear creation groaning under the burden of somebody who's probably not so worried about being in traffic, but the financial pressures, maybe the diagnosis, maybe just the reality of a broken marriage in life, maybe all these things is groaning heavily in the car next to you. Take note of it. Take a few minutes and look and see what's groaning around you. Take this next week and count the cost of sin. Watch the local news. Watch the national news with that question in mind. When there's another bombing at a hospital in Kabul, which is very intentional and horrific, but there's also just a fire in a hospital in Korea. And many people die in both. And you can see creation groaning under the weight of sin in places that we break and places that are just broken. We have to recognize and understand that our calling is not to pretend sin doesn't exist and thus diminish the cross of Christ. Our calling is to take a look and ask, where do I see evidence of brokenness that is simply the result of a cursed heredity? Because sin brought a curse with it, and death was its curse, and its heredity has been playing itself out generation after generation. And yet we pretend it's normal. The second thing I want you to do is ask you a more personal question. What's groaning in your own personal life? This is where it gets uncomfortable. This is where you've taken a look at the guy freaking out in the car next to you or the, the coworker who loses their temper and shouts at people or does whatever, and you quit looking at them for a little bit, and you look in and you start asking, what's broken in here? Where's the heredity of sin present in my life? When you hear yourself yelling at your family and you sound exactly like the dad you hated so much for all his yelling and verbal abuse and you recognize creation's groaning in your own life. When you see that bottle sitting on the counter and there's way too much vodka missing for one night and you hear creation groaning under the weight of the look of your kids or your husband, or your wife, and they're going, you did it again? You're drunk again? Maybe it's when you pull your phone out, you're tired of the pornography on the apps, and you look at it, and you're like, this thing's a curse. And it's brought brokenness and shame and loss into my marriage, into my friendships, into the way I treat and respect women and men and everybody else. And you just let, let it sit And let the groan and the weight of sin push down for a little bit. Let it push down for just a little bit. Feel the weight and allow death, as it was in the Old Testament, to be before us for a week. Just let death be there. Just let it sit right there in front of us. And let's count the cost of what's groaning in the world around us and what's groaning in our own lives. Are there areas of willful sin in your life? Are you suffering not only the results of living in a sinful world, but are you participating in its brokenness? I'm not asking you to fix anything. I'm asking you to take enough time to really diagnose it and see the effect of sin around you and in you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, today we we come and we recognize that there is inherently something broken within us, a heredity of sin that doesn't leave us in a place where we feel it's fixable. But that's not the gospel. The gospel must come alive in us. And so we ask today that in order to understand the life that is to come, we would look at the death that is all around us. And we would be broken by its presence in our life. We'd be people filled with heartache, not because we're terrible people, but because we are broken people. Because the heredity of sin has had its effect in our lives, and death is ever before us and all around us. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and do the one thing that no man or woman could ever do. Convict us of the sin that we think is no big deal. 
remove from us the shield and the cry of I'm a good person. May that never be heard of us again. May we be people who understand the weight of our choices. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. I want to show you something real quick. On this, the least fun Sunday ever. <laughs> See, there's something that happens in Scripture when people know the weight of their sin. They quit looking within to find answers. And they find one who somehow made the leap, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Jesus, Mother Teresa's okay. And in Jesus, Grandma's okay. And in Jesus, even Pastor Eric's going to make it through. <laughs> in Jesus, and this is going to be the tough one, had Adolf Hitler wanted to know forgiveness and redemption, he'd be okay. Yeah, right? <laughs> See, here's the thing. There's one who made it through. There's one who made it through. But our heredity of sin must first and foremost be dealt with. We can't just lean back and be like, oh, it's all okay. It's not okay. Death is ever before us. And this isn't the normal ending to a sermon for us here at the Foundry. But don't leave here feeling free to be like, well, I can shake that one off and come back for a better sermon next week. Please don't do that. I want you to leave here and find, with good effort, the places that are broken around you. And in you, I want you to be keenly aware of your sin because the Apostle Paul, after writing this scripture, at the end of this text, there is a sentence that says, right at the end of, like the rest, we were deserving of wrath, but thanks be to God. Before we get to the but, I invite you to go and deal with what's dead in your life, in my life, the world around us, and at least name that which is ever in front of us, the consequence of sin, so that we can come back and name who is Lord over it. Please don't feel comfortable doing nothing out of this. Because if we are to be the church, we have to be the church redeemed in Christ, not in good people. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. It is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you are dismissed.